Good morning. It's lovely to see you and welcome back to his opening with Trust and Pray on a more uh, regular basis. Um, we're a bit lopsided because we're moving in and filling the pews from that side, but that's uh, okay. Marion, do you want me to like, just come down a couple of rows just so that others can fill from the back if they arrive? It's, I'm told that the pews are very uncomfortable. Uh, and so while we're going to be allowed to sing, uh, we can, with masks on, we'll do so quietly, but we will stand up so that we can stand up and sit down. Uh, and it seems appropriate to start with a song about coming into this place to worship. We have come into this place to call upon his name. And worship Him. We have come into this place to call upon His name and worship Him. We have come into this place to call upon His name and worship Christ. A psalm for giving thanks. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I guess for any of us that's who we are this morning. A sense of gladness that we are able to, to reopen as it were. And we, we do so with, after having had a church meeting on Monday night. And the general consensus was that we would, in this reopening, take baby steps. So that's why we um, encourage the use of masks, but we know that it's not 
uh, necessarily a legal requirement. We'll continue to use the one-way system that is coming through the blue doors, coming down this aisle, across, up that aisle, then out that door, to the left and down to Grape Street, filling up the queues from um, uh, from what I left in order to maintain social distancing. We have agreed that we can sing, um, but this is low level, uh, talking voices rather than singing out loud. We prefer that the toilets were not used, but sometimes we need to do what we need to do. And if we use the toilets, we have a green and red cap system on the door. There are five independent toilets about the building. Uh, we're considering them to be gender neutral. If you use the toilet, when you come out, take the green cap, turn it round red so that no one else uses it until uh, the toilets are out of use. There will be no teas or coffees served uh, and we will have minimised the interaction inside. But what we do generally congregate the great sheet afterwards with a conversation. And the, the current plan is that we will consider with these uh, protocols at the local church meeting on the 27th of September. Of course, uh, we'll keep a watch on what's happening in the news from the government and their statements. So moving forward, the 25th of July, is, we're having a small uh, series on Solomon, and this morning we'll think about Pharaoh's daughter, and in the next couple of weeks, think about Solomon's wisdom and his construction of the temple. 15th of August, Chris Newton uh, is going to be taking the service again. Chris and I will be away for a few weeks, and in the following weeks, John and Phil will take responsibility uh, for that, bringing us up to the church meeting in September. Let's take a time then to commit ourselves to God by only service. Our God and our Father, we thank you that we have indeed come into this place, and we pray that we will, as we've come in, Worship you. Forgetting about ourselves and the things that would occupy our minds, our concerns, our hearts. Just leaving them at the door as we come in to think again of your great love and that great love that was shown to us. That we are indeed your people. The sheep of your pasture. It staggers us to think, our Father, that you could send Jesus for someone such as me. But yet we recognize that you did. And as we this morning look at the communion table beside us, we realize how great your love for us. That not only would you give Jesus, but that Jesus would come and die on that cross. So help us this morning, our Father, to concentrate on you and to worship you, and to worship Christ the Lord. So I ask this in the name of Jesus. I guess if I was to talk about Solomon and his, um, his wives, we tend to think of what happened later on in his life, what happened later on in the story, that he loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edenites, and Sidonites, and Hittites. But Pharaoh's daughter was very much the first. Pharaoh's daughter very much appears at the start of his reign. And um, while these other wives really, in general, brought condemnation upon Solomon, because they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they'll turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast. And well, that was the general statement. I want to look at actually specifically what was involved with his relationship with the daughter of Pharaoh of Egypt. But the exhortation, of course, remains that we shouldn't intermarry with people who have other gods because they will turn your hearts after their gods. Let's stand again. It's a song I will serve before the Lord. Coming. Okay.
it comes to available readings and cross things, the yeah, so one, one of the things we've had to do is to keep a few Bibles uh, and I've tried to get the scrolling to work. Uh, uh, I can see it's been pretty unsuccessful. So we we'll just have to hope that the Bible reading on the scrolling uh, does not do the similar to the speed. 1 Kings 3 verses 1 to 13. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because the temple had not, been, had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. And Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burnt incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God asked, Ask for whatever you want, to gi you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God, to, so God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honour, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings.
morning just went to take a sermon to three little subsections where we think about Solomon's wife, where we think about his worship, where we think about his wisdom, and see if there are any uh, practical lessons we might learn before heading towards the time of reunion. And of course, we started with these words. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace in the temple of the Lord. So this was right at the start of Solomon's reign, before he had started doing all these great works that we became into the world. And as I said at the start, it stands in comparison to the, the um, verses we read earlier about loving many women despite the commands of the Lord. And I guess that would bring us then to a first pertinent question. Was Solomon right or wrong in marrying Pharaoh's daughter? And I think, strictly speaking, if we look at it in detail, we discover this, that he actually didn't break any laws. We read afterwards that he continued to walk after God. Despite marrying this foreign woman, this foreign woman hadn't turned his head to the gods of the Ammonites or Canaanites or whoever. So he didn't break any laws. And marrying this woman didn't compromise his relationship with God. This thing that he did didn't compromise his relationship with God. He still had a heart to walk after the Lord. By the same token, can we say that Solomon was right or wrong in marrying these other women? And if we use the same yardstick, we discover that that did compromise his relationship with God. And so, when we consider Solomon's relationship with these women, and we think about the choices that we are presented in life, how are we to make those choices and surely it comes down to how will this affect my relationship with my God Solomon's relationship with Pharaoh's daughter didn't compromise his relationship with God it, it happened before he built the temple, before he sacrificed he still wanted to do these things and I guess this is something that we should bear in mind because as Christians, we have the Christian liberty. If Christ has set you free, you are free indeed. And so, being outside the law gives us a liberty and choice. Paul would say, let no man condemn you in meat or drink. But what you do, how you live your life, it was a big thing in those days about uh, cheap meat being sold that had been offered to idols. You know, you could go to the, the bargain shop and get this cheap meat that had been offered to idols. And the Jews were, you know, the, 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 the righteous Jews were very much, no, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Paul would explain about Christian liberty. If Christ would set you free, you are free indeed. But the Aztec we're saying is, how does the choices that I make affect my relationship? Paul to the first Corinthian churches. Everything is permissible. But not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Though they should seek his own good, not the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We are bombarded with choices. Some minor, some not so minor. And really, we have a freedom to choose as we would like. So this yardstick that Solomon has is it beneficial. Will it? How will it affect my relationship with my God? And as we said, Pharaoh's daughter hadn't turned David Solomon's head away from the Lord, because we could read. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burnt incense on the high places. 
again that's quite good up on that little word except except and that would imply to us that there was a shortcoming in his worship and to understand that shortcoming we need to know a little bit about the history and that in most instances in the bible the high places were associated with pagan worship as the people were about to come into the land god said to moses and the people destroy all the carved images and their cast idols and demolish all their high places you can get the idea if god is up there then the high places are a place where we're actually closer physically to him and it was used for worship and if we were to read the parallel passage in two chronicles, we'd read that Solomon and the whole assembly went to the high place at Gibeon. The Lord's tent of meeting was there, which Moses, the Lord's servant, had made in the desert. This was the, the tabernacle, this complicated series of tents and curtains with a lot of uh, furniture, uh, altars and the like. And that was in this place called Gibeon. But perhaps the most significant piece of furniture associated with the tabernacle was a thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And that wasn't there. That had been taken out. That had become almost synonymous with a, a good luck charm that the Israelites would take with them when they went into battle. And they would use it to say God is with us and that would help them prevail when they fought and that had been removed from its place in the tabernacle and we would read that David had brought up the ark of God from Kirith Gerath to the place he prepared for it because he pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem David had pitched a new tent not the tabernacle so when we look at Solomon's worship we see this word except except tabernacle, the tent, with all their altars, was a place of sacrifice. And indeed Solomon burnt a thousand offerings on that altar. But by contrast, the ark for the people of Israel was associated with the dwelling place of God. It was said that God dwelt between the cherubim, these two cast angels, at the side of the chest. In the name of the Lord Almighty, who is going between the cherubim and the ark. Solomon's worship was perhaps then ritualistic. It, it was in the wrong place. It wasn't where God was in terms of the, the mosaic, the Jewish ideologies. But yet, despite all that, despite going and being in the wrong place, we read this, but at Gibeon, the high place, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said to him, ask for whatever you want me to give you. This was in the wrong place. We know it's in the wrong place because the Bible said, except, except. And yet, God still met with him. God's, God's promises made to Solomon's father, David, were non-conditional. So despite getting things wrong, Solomon gets the blessing. You see, it wasn't what Solomon was doing. It was what his heart was. Remember when the prophet picked out David he said about David, this is a man after God's own heart. And although Solomon may not have got something wrong, they accept things. God was looking at his heart. You know, sometimes we get things wrong. Sometimes we all hung up about getting things wrong. That's good. But we've already talked about Christian liberty and freedom and choices. And even when we make 
optimal choices. God is looking at our heart. And if we're making wrong choices for the what, what we presume, suppose, to be the right reasons, God is looking at our heart. God, I am suggesting, is looking at the heart of Solomon and blessed him for his heart was after God. So Solomon met with God. And God says to him, What do you want me to give you? We could have asked us with red for wealth, long life, life. But he says, No, I would like a discerning heart. I'm a young man. These people are numerous. This country I'm in charge of. I've got my brothers who would want to usurp me because they think, as elder brothers of sons of David, they have the right. Give, give me wisdom, give me a wise heart. says to him, Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before, and none like you shall arise after. And we'll go on to think in a future week about how this wisdom of Solomon manifested itself. I guess there's a sense we need to be careful what we wish for. Solomon's wisdom became well known, and of course we know that the Queen of the Sheba heard of his fame and came to Solomon and tested him with hard questions. I suppose at times it might have been a bit irksome to Solomon that his wisdom was always being tested. He had become a thing of interest. Let's see what Solomon says about this. There is this sense that we have to be careful what we wish for. And I guess as a church, as a collective at the moment, we are very interested to find out the will of God for us collectively. And so far as, as individuals. And if we are prepared for God's purpose to be revealed to us, are we prepared to accept the answer? And that's always the challenge, isn't it? You know, if you say, Lord, I'm surrendering myself to you, what if the Lord turns around and says, Well, what about that? What about this? That's no challenge. And yet, if we pray wisely, and we remember that Solomon was commended for praying wisely, for praying for a wise and discerning heart, we notice how that God adds to the blessing. God gives to Solomon that which he did not ask you. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked him for, both riches and honour, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among peoples. And I guess really what I'm saying in conclusion is that Solomon really would make bad choices. Had life changing decisions. He perhaps, in a sense, didn't even grasp how we ought to worship. He built this wonderful, magnificent temple and concluded in his prayer of blessing that God doesn't live in buildings made with hands. He felt his inability to, to do all that that lay in front of him, building the temple, managing the country. Yet, he was mightily used by God. And in a sense, he came under that great unconditional promise that was given to David about his throne enduring forever. And I love God's unconditional promises. And we are under God's unconditional promises. The greatest of which is described in John 3.16 For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Yes, I suppose it's conditional in our belief but having believed 
everything else, the wrong steps that we make, the bad choices that we make, they, they don't matter. Because we have believed, we have become children of God. Sons and heirs, joint heirs with Christ. We fall into all the promises of eternal life. Being with God forever in my Father's house, there are many mansions. We all come under those unconditional promises of God. But as we come to a time of communion, we remember how those conditional promises are realized. That God couldn't just turn his head away and forget our sins and our wrongdoings. God couldn't just say, oh, don't forget about it. God had to deal with our sins and our wrongdoing. And the one who knew no sin became sin for us. That in us, righteousness of God may be revealed. Let's come to a time of worship then with this song. Our deep Father's love for us. <laughs>
follow me with pink and rose box. I will submit my ransom. Or follow me. I will fight with me the one such as me and die for a wretch such as me. Very deep to the Father's love for us. Very tremendous. The God so loved. Thank you for this this morning, our Father. And as we come to this table now, to take of this bread, we would acknowledge that this was given by him at that Last Supper as a means by which we should remember him. This bread signifying his body being broken. Make one of us. We pray, our Father, that as we take this bread, our hearts and minds would be fixed on him. As we appreciate what he has done, we give you worship for hearts. For this we ask in Jesus' name. And we remember that on the night he was betrayed, Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it and said this is my body for you. I asked the sample to come to walk round Oh sorry. Let's eat the bread as we receive it. And we remember our Father that not only was his body broken, but that his blood was shed. We have read of Solomon offering a thousand burnt offerings, but none of these our Father could in any way atone for sin. They were just types, patterns, representations of what was to come. That this one man made one sacrifice for sins forever. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't atone. We are much brighter than the snow, than the blood of the Lamb, than the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And writer we could say, see from his hands, his feet, and his sin. Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did there such love and sorrow meet for thorns composed? So that you can. Our Father, we cannot begin to imagine the pain and anguish that he endured. He endured for us. But we rejoice in the fact that he did. That his blood was shed to set the captive free. And his blood atones for everything. 
again, we would pray that as we take this cup, our hearts, our thoughts, we set on him and the price that was paid to bring us our liberty and our hope. Bless us again, we pray as we share this cup, as we ask this in Jesus' name. Remember that on the night that the supper being ended, he took the cup and said, This is my blood. This time, as we receive the cup, we'll hang on to them and we'll all drink them together. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses me from all my sin. Our God, our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come back into this building, this place, where we I acknowledge with Solomon that the God of the heavens doesn't live in a temple made by hands. We thank you that this is a place where we can meet and worship you. And we pray, our Father, we might have given to you something of in our worship this morning as we've contemplated you and all your goodness to us. We just pray, our Father, that something of this service might be an encouragement to us through the week. We remember those in prayer, our Father, this morning, those that need our prayers. We think of Louis and the issues with his kidneys. We pray for blessing, for health, and indeed for healing here. We think too of Peter and Kathy, and we just pray for them at this time. May the circumstances there come to a resolution. We pray for Christine having to isolate the practical difficulties that entails. We pray for each other, our Father. You know the thoughts of our hearts. You know the anxieties, the worries that we have. Give us again, our Father, a sense of your peace. And us all bless us for good. As we ask this in the name of Jesus. Closing him is be there.
adapted from the blessing that Solomon prayed over the temple. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for men will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays towards this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigner asks of you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house we have built bears your name. Amen. <laughs> 